Boker Tov. Today is June 14th, 2014. We're at Camp Vermont, Wisconsin. My name is Mayor Stiebel. I shall be 83 years old in a few weeks. In 1947, I was just turning 16, and I was among the first campers uh, at the very first Camp Vermont, Wisconsin. I grew up with my family on the north side of Chicago. My parents were instrumental in the founding of Congregation Shari Tikva, where I went to Hebrew school. And until the summer of 1947, I had gone to Boy Scout camp for two weeks every summer, but otherwise worked in my father's store. Uh, my mother got very involved in women's league affairs, sisterhood, and in, towards the end of 1946, she heard that there was plans to create a Jewish kosher educational Hebrew-speaking camp. Uh, she was asked, uh, because of her women's league and sister connections, to be on the camp committee. And uh, by 1947, the camp came into action. Land was purchased, and uh, I was on the first train from Chicago to Conover, and a bus from Conover to the camp itself. Uh, growing up at Boy Scout camps, I admired the young what were called rangers, counselors at Boy Scout camps. These were rugged men in leather jackets and blue jeans, young, athletic, and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, it was a bit rainy when we got off the bus, the yellow school bus uh, rented from the of a train station to the camp, and the first person greeting us was the head counselor. He said his name was David. He was in a leather jacket and blue jeans, young, athletic, and he said, call me David. I found out later that was David Lieber, who had just become a rabbi a year previously, and I said, well, this probably won't be too bad if that's what the, the head council looks like. The camp was beautiful but, but quite rugged. Uh, up to this point, there was little history of Jewish kosher camping in America. There was a Mossad camp in the east, a small Zionist, and there was a privately owned uh, Sedgwin camps by uh, Mr. A.P. Schoolman, an educator, called the Sedgwin camps. But that was really it. Uh, the seminary did a very good job of uh, giving information to rabbis around the country as to uh, seeing to the camp was sold up. We had 100 campers the first year. There were uh, 59 uh, boys and 41 girls. And the bulk, uh, 57 came from Chicago area synagogues, 14 came from New York, uh, 8 from Philadelphia. Other than that, it was quite clear that the influence of conservative rabbis around the country uh, showed where the ones and two children came from from around the country. Uh, among other places, uh, two from Minneapolis, two Des Moines, two Tulsa, a couple from Townsend, New Jersey, one from St. Louis, two from Toledo, one from Omaha, uh, one from Cleveland, one girl, her name is Greenberg, a 14-year-old, came from Eveleth, Minnesota. Eveleth is in the far northern end of Minnesota on the Iron Range. Uh, by uh, 1968, I was very involved in the camp commission as an adult, and we learned that the parents of small uh, of the small towns all around America were most anxious to have their children come to a Ramah camp because they had no other Jewish friends other than the eight weeks in the summer. And uh, this Greenberg girl in Everett was an example of that. And it also was quite clear the influence of powerful conservative rabbis around the country who sent kids from their synagogue even their first year. In, uh, from Chicago, Rufate Siddick, Reverend Ralph Simon was the, the genius behind the conception of, of Camp Ramah, uh, along with uh, wealthy men in his community, Lou Weiner among others, and they raised the money uh, from other generous people around the Chicago area. And these uh, founding uh, generous people had no children of their own of Ramah age. They already were beyond that. They were truly altruistic. But uh, again, clearly, we had uh, the influence of Rabbi Aronson in Minneapolis, the rabbi in um, St. Louis, uh, uh, the uh, Park Synagogue in Cleveland, Omaha, Kansas City. Uh, these were the, where, the, where the kids came from. The camp was extremely rustic uh, when we got here. The road from the, the highway, 41, was a narrow, kind of blacktop road. When we got on County K, there was gravel. From County K to Bowers Resort was hard packed dirt, very muddy in the uh, in rainy weather. From, from Bowers Resort to the camp was nothing more than two ruts 
in the sand on a very, very narrow, hilly, uh, with sharp curves going to the camp. It took forever just to come from Bowers. Uh, there was no room for two cars to pass. If another car came at you, uh, a car had to pull off into the bushes. A couple of years later, my parents were visiting my brother here, I think it was 1950, he was a JC or a camper, and they had a head-on collision on this narrow road, but there was no damage because the cars were going at five miles an hour and the people, cars had bumpers at that time. One night a week was movie night, and there were scattered camps around this broad Northwoods area and a few resorts. But again, because the roads were so impassable, the movies came in once a week by seaplane. That was a big event uh, for the campers because the seaplane would buzz the lake first to let the camp know they were coming. And it was the schut, the merit, the privilege of the swim counselor to row out in a rowboat, <laughs> meet the pilot on his pontoon, shake hands and, and get the film exchanging it from the week before. These were not Jewish films by any means, by the way. They're old Hollywood movies. That was a big thrill to see this little seaplane land. Electricity was provided by two very old and very overburdened generators. This was originally a fishing camp. Uh, the uh, generators went out very often. Often there was no power or very little power. The, there was about roughly 10 little log cabins on the grounds, plus two somewhat larger cottages on the point uh, by the lake. These cabins were meant for two men in two cots a, and some space for clothes and um, a, a nightstand. Uh, at once, instead of those two cots, four double-decker bunks moved into each of these cabins so they could accommodate eight boys or girls. Very, very crowded. It was a nice porch. These were all log cabins. The uh, seminary had no experience running a camp, and they assumed that our cabin of eight 16-year-old boys didn't need a counselor. <laughs> this was remedied within 10 days uh, because they found that we, they took an assistant swim counselor and moved in to join us. Now, there was no space for him, uh, but it was a nice porch with a nice window, and I already had a lot of experience in camping, uh, Boy Scouts, uh, Eagle Scout. And I volunteered to sleep on the porch. There was a big window, so my single bunk was right at that window, and I could partake in all the fun games of my friends inside. Uh, I had uh, sort of canvas awnings uh, on the screen porch, so it was very pleasant. I looked at the lake. Uh, the wind blew, and I, I was outside. I felt the whole uh, summer. Now, of course, we had no council to begin with, but the cabin of our equivalent. Uh, 16-year-old girls, they had two counselors for start. I, I wonder, probably wondered why. The cabin counselors at the time were both teachers and activity specialists, whether or not they knew the specialty. Uh, the creation of a separate teaching faculty was an innovation many years later. About the only structure remaining today from 1947 is, is the Merkaz, the teacher's center. The core of that building, only the core, uh, was the Beit Am. It was a small building and yet we could squeeze all a hundred of us uh, campers and staff into that building. There was even a bit of a makeshift tiny stage with a curtain. Uh, today that building has been expanded on all sides. One other sort of partial par uh, building remaining is the center of the camp director's home, Beit To as it's called. The core of that building uh, was the original uh, building. Of course that's been moved. Uh, also, what is now the office of the um, camp was an original building, thoroughly remodeled inside and out, and the owner of the fishing lodge uh, dwelled there until uh, the Ramak Commission bought it. <clears throat> the kitchen, the first year, was very rudimentary. Originally, the kitchen was a simple log cabin with the small dining room attached, uh, looking north uh, over the lake. It was probably accommodated 40 or 50 people with staff and fishermen in total, a, a wood-burning uh, uh, stove. We needed, of course, a meat and dairy kitchen, so in a big hurry, a, a big, I can only describe it as a big plywood box of a building was built on beyond to the south of this log cabin, or what became the dairy kitchen. Um, in a rush, a lot of things were forgotten. First of all, they forgot to build a food storeroom. They forgot an oven hood. 
They forgot an exhaust system. They forgot a dish machine. They also forgot staff lodging and, and, a, and a toilet, washrooms, okay? Um, we camper waiters had to go through the, from the meat kitchen through the dairy kitchen to get to the dining room. The only toilets in camp were two toilet buildings. One outside the kitchen door, which became the girls' toilet room, and another toilet building where the um, library is today. Of course, the first year there was no library in the camp. The uh, meat kitchen bottled gas uh, serviced army surplus stoves, and um, I'm getting ahead of the story, but in 1951 I was a, a cook at a uh, camp and a canoeing counselor besides. I had a girlfriend who I later married two years later. She was given a job as a secretary. I was off duty for my cooking, and I went to see my young lady friend after supper. She said to me, Mayor, you got to take a shower. Your clothes and you smell from the bottle of gas. Um, there was no other electricity and, and no other gas lines. The toilets was a whole other story. No sewage, of course, um, even to this day. Uh, we had three first cooks that first year. They came and went, and um, somehow we fed the 100 campers and, and 50 staff. The um, camp was divided into two divisions, the Mahon, which were 15 and 16-year-olds, and everyone else below. There were roughly 40 kids in the upper division and 60 among the younger kids. The tuition was $400 for the campers and $200 for the Mahon, it being understood that we would be given certain duties, uh, whatever they may be assigned to us, including being waiters uh, and other duties as was seen fit. I had some food experience already uh, cooking for the Boy Scouts uh, and in my own house with my uh, family and I was made there for a head waiter, happy to do that. But again we had cooks were coming and going and I'll read in a moment from the camp director's report of that first year. So we often were without a cook and uh, I immediately was elevated to help prepare food in a rudimentary fashion. A couple of the wives of the staff also helped out uh, because there were often days without cooks, without a major cook there. Uh, a couple of days the main course was tuna salad. We could do that. We opened a lot of number 10 cans. The kitchen was full of number 10 cans. Also we had to upgrade, uh, upgrade some of the Mahon kids to help in the kitchen as well just with food preparation. There was, there was no other choice. Uh, the food was average at best. Uh, and we were rather disorganized. I'm going to quote from the uh, camp director's report of the first year, and then we'll get on to my, my last year in a few minutes, uh, 1951. Well, one other memory that's um, kind of unusual. Uh, on the lake uh, to the um, east, uh, in front of a few of the cabins, there was an ice house. Now, this lake, of course, froze over. Trucks would go on the lake in the winter and ice was harvested during the winter months and placed in an ice house. This ice house had thick walls, double walls of wood with sawdust between. There were pine boughs and canvas on top of sawdust. And for the first half of the summer, a truck would drive through the camp, pulling ice out of this ice house until it was depleted. To this very day, I know where to go along that lake shore uh, by the hillside, and the soil is still moist with uh, moss and things from where that ice house was. A, a little memory. Let me uh, quote from the camp director's report. The camp director was Henry R. Goldberg. Uh, he was the educational director of East Midway Jewish Center in Brooklyn, a fine educator. He, of course, had no camp experience whatsoever. Uh, and here is his report the summer 1947 sent to the seminary uh, later that year. He praised the counselors who worked under very tough conditions. There's no lounge, there's no place for the, to live to congregate. But he says, we must express dissatisfaction with the kitchen up. The cooks were irresponsible, wasteful of food, and were mostly interested in their weekly wage. Nor can much be said in favor of the dishwashers who regarded their stay in camp as a vacation. The selection of Rabbi Blank 
as the business manager was at Fortune. I won't mention his name. Although he meant well, he knew very little about camping. His purchase for the camp were unwisely made, for he bought the most expensive food without regard to the taste of the campers. He was too busy with his own Orthodox congregation in Chicago at the time when he was needed in camp. He never got to the camp. His unforeseen preoccupation with his sick wife and child tended to aggravate the entire situation. It was his responsibility to see to it that the purchases made in preparation for the opening of the camp came on time. In fact, they did not. Upon arrival in camp, we found that very little that we urgently needed was on hand. Kitchen utensils, food, office supplies, sports goods, and numerous other items were lacking. The result that camp program was not in full swing until well into the third of July. Again, the situation with the cooks was very unsatisfactory. Either they were temperamental or they could not cook. There was considerable change of kitchen personnel throughout the summer. It was only through cajoling and granting of unwarranted increases that we were able to complete the season without disturbing the camp routine too much. The livers were very poor. Our orders arrived late and part of them unfilled. Add to the fact that we lacked the necessary kitchen utensils had to cook on only one stove, the result could not be anything but unsatisfactory. Not only were there too many campers to a bunk, but the camp was sold out. Uh, but there was no room to accommodate additional counselors that really were badly needed. Uh, also, the selection of some unqualified campers was in violation of the basic principles of the camp, where we should supposed to be Hebrew speaking. We could not speak Hebrew, uh, not very well. Uh, however, in contrast to more recent years, unfortunately, in that era, the counselors only spoke Hebrew among themselves. They had to speak some English to us, even us older kids, to understand what was going on. All announcements were made in Hebrew. We never heard a counselor speak uh, English to one another. Uh, we were taught at least try one mila in a mishpah, get one word in a sentence, two words in a sentence of Hebrew uh, as the summer went on. The failure of the business manager's wife to carry out her duties because of illness left us without a bookkeeper and a receptionist. The result was that uh, other people had to fill in. It was, it was not good, he says. <laughs> now, we were isolated, okay? Among the things he wants for the next year, Mr. Goldberg says, immediate steps should be taken to have a telephone installed. The need for it is obvious. You can imagine. Uh, the only communication in the outside world was by telegraph. And uh, the railroad office in, station in Conover had a telegraph machine, of course, and that's the only method of communication. So we were very much on our own. Uh, if a telegraph was received in Conover, it would be brought over by a long journey by road. And if Mr. Goldberg wanted to get out to the, his bosses in the seminary, it had to go by road to the telegraph operator. Uh, among the other things, he, he has a long list of needs that he like. He says, among other things we ought to have are, there ought to be partitions between the toilets and the boys' so washroom. Now, let's uh, move ahead a little bit. Um, how things changed in the summer of, uh, by the summer of 1951. I had a unique situation there. In 1950, I was camping, canoeing, and uh, nature counselor. Pay was okay, uh, but, and the camp was, uh, was growing, of course. The, um, the summer of 1951, I was asked to come back in that role, and it was not going to be enough money. I had a lot of cooking experience by that point, and I said, "Look, I'll be third cook, and in my spare time, in the off duty hours in the uh, between lunch and supper, I had two, three-hour break. I would teach the canoeing classes, uh, which I did. I showed them that I ought to be there when the camp opened, two weeks before the campers, and I stayed till the camp closed two weeks afterwards. So I was there for eight weeks, the summer of 1951. I earned $50 a week, $600 for the summer. In terms of inflation, think this. I was then going from the University of Illinois at Chicago, finishing two years there, living at home to the University of Minnesota in the fall of 51. Uh, because I had a, a fine job at Bethel, Minneapolis, uh, as co-youth director and teacher, along with my college studies. But the $600 paid for an entire quarter at the University of Minnesota. Room, board, tuition, books, laundry, train fare home once. Um, and that was inflation. And uh, I enjoyed my role. It worked hard, but I found it uh, well worthwhile. 
one of the compliments for Camp Ramah and my years on the uh, Camp Commission was the slow growth we did here in Wisconsin as the camp grew. And it's sort of fascinating because in 1968, for 20 years when I was on the National Ramah Commission, I was deeply involved visiting the various Ramah camps during the summer. And we had tremendous financial and physical problems at many of these camps. At least two camps had to be closed, one in Connecticut, one in Glen Spey, New York. The Nyack uh, Day Camp was in tremendous trouble uh, in those years, just not enough money. Um, and the, um, the Berkshire's camp uh, was on the verge of bankruptcy. We didn't have a problem here, we grew slowly. Look at this, in 1947 we fed 150 people. In 1951, my last year, we fed 250. The ratio typically even today is about two campers for one staff for every two campers, total, total staff. In uh, 1976, my son Victor, who was a camper, all my three kids were campers here, but by age 18, 1976, he could make more money as a cook in the kitchen, third cook, uh, rather than be a, a JC. Uh, he tells me we fed 600 people that year. It's 28 years later. 33 years later, in uh, today, by 2009, we were feeding 750 people. So it was a slow growth. It's a great tribute to the planning of our camp commission. And again, a tribute to uh, how things have worked out so well here compared to other problems in the early years of the uh, Vermont movement is that tremendous longevity of our camp directors and of our camp, local Camp Vermont Commission people. Our Camp Vermont Commission people to this day is made up of former campers who are all growing up like me, uh, totally altruistic. Their kids are long since been out of the camp and we keep new people coming onto the Camp Commission. And by the, by 1951, we started a the feeling of long-term camp directors. Mr. Goldberg was there for two years, Hill Silverman a couple of years. Then came the era of Lou Newman and Seymour Fox. And by then, the philosophy, the educational philosophy in the camp really developed. And uh, soon thereafter, Rabbi Burtcoat, who was my buddy in a camp, in a cabin at age 16, never missed a summer, moved up the ranks. He became camp director for countless years. And then Rabbi Soloff uh, thereafter for countless years. Due to the genes of these two fellows, the continuity and our lay leadership and the tremendous fundraising ability, which I, I cannot uh, give him enough gratitude, Ramah has functioned uh, so beautifully today. Differences between Ramah in 1947 through 51, 50 of the camp, and today. In the early years, we modeled many things we have to keep them seen in Israel. On Friday, we were told to bring white clothes and only white clothes for Shabbat. White shirt, white pants, girls and boys both. There was a flag raising uh, every morning. Uh, again, typical of the kibbutz scene there. Things were patterned after that. Uh, there was a color war uh, the first few years, and then under uh, Lou Goodman's administration, Seymour Fox, it was decided to reduce competition. We used to have uh, baseball games between different camps in the North Woods here, starting from the first year. And on the one hand, Lou Newman admired uh, the Boy Scouts uh, and the, the Eagle Scout rank, but he felt that the competition was considered not, not quite what he wanted. There were always winners and losers, and he wasn't thrilled about the losers. He was a genius, uh, wonderful camp director, uh, taught us a lot. 1947 obviously was, was rather disorganized. Uh, the things that were similar were classes, which were required. And uh, Mr. Goldberg in his report mentioned that a lot of uh, people coming weren't aware of the classes and didn't want to go to classes, and that was uh, enforced as best they could. Mr. Goldberg, again, uh, clearly had no camping experience. He did not own a pair of short pants. He was constantly, no matter how hot it was, was walking around in, in long, uh, baggy pants. The food, of course, was, was not good. It's a thousand percent better today. You can't compare it. Uh, to the sadness of all of us on, on the camp commissions around the country, there is far, far less Hebrew today than it was in the early years. And uh, that's sad. Uh, we can't get into the reasons for that. The, uh, the facilities are, of course, far better. Cabins today have, have toilets in each cabin. Uh, but Tuesday is no problem. Uh, there's more singing, there's uh, 
the spirit was always good there, of course. Uh, I think those were among the, the big differences. And of course, the camp is so well organized philosophically um, and the guidance from the New York office. When I was on the camp from our, on the uh, National from our Commission in 1968, the finances for the um, National Rock Commission it was paltry, it was just awful. Um, and now, thank goodness, that's, that's changed tremendously. The camps generally are all sold out. We're serving probably, I would guess, five to 6,000 uh, young people a year in the Ramah system, which is a far cry from the, the 100 back then. And of course, the, con the concept of the camp was to develop lay leaders and, and uh, professional leadership in the uh, community, and that certainly has turned out that way. In my own cabin, Mary Bird Cohn, or Matthew Simon, uh, we had a young fellow from Des Moines, Everett Gendler, who was a little too old to be a, a camper. Everett was about 18 or 19 years old, but he had some basic Jewish interest, but not a great deal of background whatsoever. He eventually became a conservative rabbi, and it's been this way through the years. Um, Yochanan Muffs, my goodness, Joe Lukinski, the, the, the list never ends. Uh, my friends, many of course are now retired, uh, going on to professional careers uh, and leadership roles in the Jewish community. I remember vividly uh, Bethel Highland Park, Illinois, was like other Chicago synagogues, given a quota of how many campers they could uh, allow, how they could have to the camp because the camp was always sold out. Uh, Rabbi Lippis uh, identified certain children in his Hebrew school, and he would say to the parents, this young man, this Mort Steinberg, has to go to Camp Ramah. He's 10 or 11 years old, and it's the last thing the world had the child or the parents thought of, but uh, Rabbi Lippis would uh, <laughs> control the camp committee to get more openings somehow, uh, so that more kids would be sitting out of uh, Rabbi Simon and Rufi Tzedek always, of course, had a lot of kids coming from that area. The first year, his uh, son uh, Matthew, his daughter Tamara, went. The son of his principal, uh, Jerry Bernstein, he was going to came. Another young man, uh, Dick Rappaport, came. Uh, and I only know the kids generally my age from these synagogues uh, who came. Uh, we had uh, one young Israeli boy who came the first year, Ruven Grunwald. Ruven was an Israeli, he had just come to America. <laughs> His parents sent Ruve to camp from Wisconsin to learn English, <laughs> which I'm sorry to say he learned uh, very, very fast. It was um, uh, quite an experience.